let's make a game. In this video, we are going to look at the setup of our advanced movement to better understand what each of the variables do and how we can change them to take control of the movement physics in our game. Let's start by going to nerdyteachers.com. The direct link to this page is in the description. This page gives detailed explanations of how the simple and advanced movement code works. So let's look at the advanced movement. We first provide you with some example game code for testing and playing around with the advanced movement code. You can copy paste this into an empty Pico 8 game and use it for experimenting with the physics. So let's do that. The first thing we need to do though is draw something in sprite number one. We are not going to worry about animating this player character, so a single sprite will do for testing. Now that we have our player sprite, we can run the game. This is the same code used to move the player in the platformer series, so left and right to run, and X to jump. You can see in the upper left corner that we are printing the DX and DY variables, just so that you can see how they change based on the buttons we press and the physics code in the game. I just want to show you one trick to make the same physics look and feel different simply by changing the size of our character. So this one is almost 8x8 in size and has a normal jump in speed. But now I'm going to draw a tiny pixel man instead. And now with the exact same code, you can see how this guy looks like he's moving much faster and jumping much higher. And of course, a larger sprite will look and feel slower. So just keep this in mind when you are designing your game and balance your sprite size with your physics. We'll stick to the basic 8x8 size while we play with the physics here. All right, so let's look at the variables in the code that we will want to play with. And we'll go through an overview of all of them before we demonstrate playing with them because they actually work with each other. So it's important to understand how they work together first. Player is a table of variables specific to the player. X and Y are for the starting position of the player. So you can figure out where the player should start in your game and just change these coordinates to that screen position. DX and DY are basically momentum variables. And here they are just how strong the momentum starts at, but they will be updated immediately. So it's almost pointless to set these to anything other than zero here. Setting them both to zero just means the player starts out standing still. Let's just demonstrate that real quick. So this is zero, and of course we fall because the X and Y starts us in midair. So let's give the player a little push in the beginning. And that's all that does. Now the rest of these are what we will really want to experiment with. Max DX and Max DY are the speed limits that we force on the player's movement left, right, and down. We don't actually limit the jump because the jump is a single sudden force upwards instead of a constant force that needs to be limited. Now if you are following the platformer series, the speed limit is important to balance with your map collision. A high speed limit means the player can build up speed to move this many pixels each frame. And if your map collision is not checking that far ahead, then the player can wind up inside a wall. So it's a good idea to keep the max DX and max DY to low numbers, somewhere between 1 and 4. ACC is short for acceleration, and that is how much is added to our running speed left and right. Boost is the jump power, and that is how much we suddenly subtract from the player's Y position to make them spring upwards. Gravity would then take over to slow the upwards movement and pull the player back downwards until they hit the ground. The final variable we will play with is the friction. This slows the player's movement left and right and controls how easy or difficult the movement is. All right, so in general, the max DX, acceleration, and friction all work together to affect the player movement left and right, while the max DY, boost, and gravity work together to affect the player's movement up and down. Not too hard, right? Now let's have some fun. First, let's run the game again and just jump around and see what we might want to change. This is pretty nice, but let's say I want to run faster. Well, now I need to think about which variables to change. Am I running slow because of a low acceleration? 
Probably not, because acceleration is how quickly we build up speed. Am I running slow because the friction is too strong? Probably not, because the friction also shows in the build up and slow down. So it must be the max dx that is limiting my max speed. And we can see that in the upper left corner. So let's change that. I'll increase it to five and see how that feels. We are running faster now, and we can see that the dx isn't even reaching the new limit of five. Why is that? Well, it must be because the friction becomes so strong at this speed that it is taking away just as much as the acceleration is adding. So we can either increase the acceleration or decrease the friction, or both. But let's do one at a time until we really understand how they affect each other. So let's increase the acceleration first from 0.5 to how about 0.75 and try that. Now that player is really moving. Can we get it up to the limit? Just barely. But how can we even play a game with the player flying across the screen like this? So let's pull the max dx back to 4. Okay, that's a little better. And we can see the max dx kicking in to limit it to 4 when we know they could almost get up to moving 5 pixels per frame. All right, let's see what else we want to change. You know, now that we're moving so fast, it kind of feels strange to be stopping so quickly too. Do you remember which variable controls that? Friction. See, down here we are taking the player dx and multiplying it by friction. And since friction is trying to cut back the dx, it needs to be a decimal between 0 and 1. The website has a nice breakdown of how this works, and we really want to understand this to know what the friction decimal really is and how we should change it to do what we want in the game. So let's just read that first. In this example, friction is set to 0 0.85, so that is a decimal and less than 1. And let's imagine the player runs to the right to build up the dx to 3. Then, when the player stops pushing the right button, what will happen is friction will be multiplied to the dx. And here is what the math looks like for each frame that this happens. So here are the frames of the game when the math will be run. And here is the old dx with what this example starts at. And it will be multiplied by the friction 0.85. And whatever that equals, we will set that to be the new dx. Then on the next frame, that is now considered the old dx, and it will be multiplied by friction again. And notice that the dx just gets smaller and smaller every frame, and this creates the slowdown effect before the player comes to a stop. And you can see that happening in this picture. The dx is here, and it shows the player x is changing by 3 pixels. But the friction cuts a percentage of that away, so the next frame, the player only moves by 2.55 pixels and friction cuts back more and more, making dx shrink, and making the player move less each frame. Make sense? You might be saying, I get it, but I don't really get the math. Well, let's read it a little different and see if that makes it click. Most of us are more comfortable speaking in terms of percentage than decimals, and 0.85 is simply 85%. So we're basically asking here, what is 85% of the dx? And since we're thinking in percentages, you can think of dx as a glass of water. And I could tell you, I only want 85% of that glass of water. So you spill out some water and give me 85% of what was in it. But I say, no, now I only want 85% of that water. So you can think of this new amount as 100% and spill out some more so that it is only 85% of what it was. This is exactly what friction is doing and keeps doing to the dx. It's basically always asking for a smaller percentage. So if we make friction one, that's 100% and friction will be happy with 100% of the dx momentum. So the momentum never changes and your player won't ever slow down. If friction is more than one, then it wants more dx and you'll actually speed up and that's why friction must be less than 1. So when we change friction, ask yourself this. How much percent do you want to leave each frame? If we say we want to leave 99%, then we set friction to 0.99. And that means we are leaving almost all of the dx and barely slowing down. So even though the friction decimal number got bigger, it actually made friction weaker as you can see. 
and the player takes forever to slow down. But this is fun to play with, like if we leave 95%. The look and feel of these physics is like we are skating on ice, and so we could run with this and make our player a penguin. And totally make our game based around these physics settings. This is why we are so excited to give you this, not just so you can match the physics to the game you are already making, but also for coming up with awesome game ideas. The physics is a great place to start because what might look like a bug in one game could become the main feature of your next game. How awesome is that? So I could now make the friction stronger by lowering the decimal, but I quite like this fast running and sliding penguin. So let's move on to the jump. Now this testing code does not have a limit of the number of times you can jump, whereas the platformer makes sure you are on the ground before you can jump again. So actually this creates something like Flappy Bird style movement, doesn't it? Well, there we go. We could make a Flappy Bird clone. Not enough of them out there yet. <laughs> so now we have a flying penguin. It's pretty weak though. So let's make the jump power stronger. That's the boost variable. Let's make it like six. That feels much better. And I'm not even going for anything, but it just feels good in general, I guess. But if I'm happy with this strong jump, what's weird now is that it falls too slow. So now, do we increase the gravity or the max dy? Well, let's look at the dy number to see if it hits max. Yeah, so it's the max dy limit that makes it feel like a slow fall. So let's try raising it to five. And this is where the play happens. Just have fun messing with these variables. Try changing them a little or a lot and see what happens. But hopefully this video is giving you more understanding of how they work so you'll be able to change them with a good prediction of what it will do in the game. Now that actually made it harder to flappy bird around, so maybe it's too much. And here's where understanding the balance between these variables comes into play. We made a helpful little table on the same Nerdy Teachers webpage. And it's organized based on what problem you are having and shows what you should change to solve it. So after understanding what each variable does, and while you're playing around with them yourself, you can use this as a helpful reference. Whenever you find that your player is too slow, then it's easy to see what to change. Either increase acceleration, or decrease friction, or increase the max dx. And the fact that all three of those could help solve your problem, you should be aware of all of them, because they all play a part in your player's speed. So changing one may force you to change another. So it actually becomes a fun balancing act when you get down to fine tuning it for your game. So with my penguin, I thought it fell too slow. So I increased the max dy already, but now I feel like it's falling too fast. So I could bring the max dy back down a little, or as it says, I could decrease the gravity. So let's try that. And we'll set gravity to, I don't know, 0.2 and see how that feels. Ah, I kind of like that. My little penguin is jumping on a trampoline. Doesn't it look like that? You know why? Because of the little hover it's doing at the top of the jump. In basketball, that's called hang time. That peaceful pause in midair before falling back down. So now that we have less gravity, it's taking longer to slow down the jump momentum, and it takes longer to speed up the falling momentum, leaving us with a nice hang time in midair. And this feels pretty awesome, actually. The mid-air jumping looks and feels much more like the penguin is flapping its wings and flying. Of course, penguins don't fly, so maybe I should rethink the game. Oh, but I've just been given a note from the nerdy science teacher. It says, puffins are seabirds that fly, but look like a penguin. That's cool. I guess I can make a puffin game now. The daring puffin who makes his way to the slippery ice of the Antarctic meets the penguins there and tricks them into thinking he's a penguin that learned how to fly. How do I even think of these things? Wait, the nerdy arts teacher says that's happy feet too. Okay, fine, sure, no problem. Let me play with the physics some more and in a minute I'll have another great idea for a game. You all have fun too. Leave a comment, ask a question, join the nerdy community, and subscribe. 
What if there was no gravity? Oh, space game. Or, or, what if friction is really strong, like you were walking through snow? Snowball flight game. Or, 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 oh, okay, I know. What if we decrease this one all the way down, and then that'll be like...